Hi, my name is Steve Yedlin. I'm the cinematographer of Knives Out, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals and filmmakers. Today, we speak with Steve Yedlin, the director of photography for Knives Out, and we dive deep into the making of the film, his cinematography techniques and love of color science, and his custom space-saving LED light rigs. The Go Creative Show is supported by Rule Boston Camera, by Rent Create at Rule.com, and Post Lab, stress-free collaboration for Final Cut Pro. I am really excited to share this interview with you guys today. Um, Steve Yedlin, the director of photography for Knives Out. If you're not already following him, you should be. I mean, you really should be. He is, uh, he loves this stuff. He loves filmmaking. And it, it, it takes a special kind of talent to be able to talk about color science and have it be interesting. I felt like I was, I felt like I was honestly in like a masterclass talking to him. Um, there's a lot of detail, but he does it. He really can explain it well. He's an excellent teacher. And we talk a lot about things that we don't usually dive really deep into, like color science. And also we talk about kind of like the the math behind creating LUTs and, uh, uh, you know, what he puts into his custom LUTs and how really even calling them LUTs is not the right terminology. Um, we also talk a lot about digital versus film when you think, well, why are we still talking about digital versus film in 2020? But this discussion goes so much further than you would imagine a discussion about film versus digital goes. And um, th there's just so much in this episode. You guys are going to absolutely love it. So um, I can't wait for you to hear it. And I can't wait for you to let us know what you think of the episode. Now, um, if you've been following us for a while, you've seen that we've been um, putting a lot of audience questions in the episodes, and we love doing that. It's really been great. You guys have been excellent coming up with questions. Uh, the way to do it is to follow us on social media, and when we have upcoming guests, we let you know, and uh, we give you an opportunity to ask some questions, and we have a lot of audience questions in this episode, um, and that's always fun for us. You guys, I'm telling you, we've got a really smart audience we really do. You guys out there listening, you really are, um, you know, you're professionals in the industry and uh, your input is so valuable for us. So we love that. So keep it up. Follow us on social media, join our mailing list, and, um, you know, we can communicate that way. There's a lot coming up in 2020 with Go Creative Show. I cannot wait to share it, but all that information will be rolling out as time permits. But before any of it, we got to get through our interview with Steve Yedlin, right? So let's get to it. The director of photography for Knives Out here at Go Creative Show, Steve Yedlin. So I'm here with Steve Yedlin. He is the director of photography for Knives Out. And uh, we welcome him warmly and wholeheartedly to the Go Creative Show. Thanks for coming on, Steve. <laughs> Uh, thanks for having me. This is this is exciting. I just saw the film uh, just today, a couple hours ago. Oh, fantastic. A lot of fun. I can't really remember the last time I saw a film with this whodunit type of a theme. Um, uh, it, it just, it's so like different. Now, I know this idea of a whodunit film is certainly not new, but something about it feels so fresh now, especially in cinema. It just, it has a freshness to it. I'd love to get your thoughts on that and what lured you to the project. Uh, well, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> uh, it's with Ryan, who's um, <laughs> my best friend. He's your guy, director, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I'm going to do anything uh, he's doing. But, yeah, I mean, this, you know, I've been super excited about this idea from uh, from when he very first told me it as a as a kind of a husk of an idea 10 years ago. Um, you know, and I was all, and I was just more over the moon about it when I when I read this actual script that he wrote uh, about a year before we started shooting. And, uh, no, I, you know, I think you're right that it's so fresh and vibrant. And I think that's a combination of, of several things between just how much true love Ryan has for the genre and for cinema in general. He's never condescending to it or making fun of it. Um, you know, there's just so much joy and exuberance, um, you know, that combined with it really being, um, you know, thematically contemporary, it's not 
you know, it's not playing, you know, it's not playing to the, you know, the, the, the sort of idea that the, that these types of movies are always like a stuffy period piece. Um, you know, it's very contemporary in the, in the themes and even some of just the, you know, external trappings of it. Um, and, you know, on top of that, I think it's just such a, it, it has such a sense of joy in the movie that, you know, there, there's so much comedy in it, but the comedy is never, uh, you know, again, condescending or making fun of the genre, you know, cause it, there's movies, you know, which, which I love, but, you know, movies like murder by death or clue, which are very much making fun of the genre, which, yeah. which this movie doesn't do. No, none of the comedy comes from making fun of the genre. It, it wholeheartedly loves the genre. That's a good point. Cause it, it did give me a clue kind of feeling, but you're hundred percent right. Like clue was almost saying as you're watching it, like we know what we're doing. We know we're just, you know, we know we're being silly about it. We know we're being cheesy about it. That's the fun of it. Watch it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, no, that's, and that's, and that's, fantastic. and it was great. It's exactly. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. And this movie does it, it. I can't say it does the opposite per se, but it, this is just like a film, like just a, you know, this is a regular film and a great story. And it doesn't, it's not, it's, it's not being self-aware enough to be, to be saying like, we know the genre we're portraying. We're kind of in on the joke with you. It just is doing it and it's doing it well. No, absolutely. Yeah. Never it, the, the, yeah. I mean, the author's voice never is never, uh, supercilious or condescending to the genre. I mean, Ryan, Ryan just legitimately loves the genre and, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to do a hackneyed version of it. Of course, it's got to be, you know, unique and alive, but he wants to actually do it and not, you know, and, and I think sometimes people's idea of how to be, you know, original is, is to, is to condescend to the genre to kind of say that they, as a, as an author or filmmaker are above it. And, and, you know, that's how it ends up being, uh, you know, a, a parody and, and, you know, this is, this is not that, uh, at all. So the film, um, is called Knives Out. I'm sure everybody listening has seen it, but if you haven't, it's, it's kind of like a detective, you know, whodunit type of a film. There's a group of detectives trying to figure out, um, uh, they're investigating the death of a patriarch of a really eccentric kind of combative family. And it takes place in this big giant mansion, beautifully art directed, by the way. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Um, but I want to start with your relationship with the director, Ryan Johnson, because you just mentioned, you know, a couple minutes ago, you guys have been friends forever. And I'd love to know more about that and kind of how you got to where you are today. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I met Ryan when uh, we were uh, we were both, I think, 17, 18 years old. I was a I was a senior in high school. He was a freshman in college. Wow. And um, we were both volunteering on a, on a student film, just kind of helping out. And um, yeah, we met back then and we, you know, we were. We were, you know, through college, we were roommates and we, you know, we shot all kinds of little, you know, movies together, including, you know, not just the the technical student films like this, the films that were actually for school, but just we would, you know, just on weekends, we'd be like, hey, you want to shoot something this weekend? And we'd, you know, we'd say that on Friday night and by Sunday morning, we'd have or by Sunday night, we'd have something cut and, you know, our version of final sound done on it, which obviously was a very uh, homemade thing, but, uh, yeah, and it was, it was all just for fun, but it was a lot of, um, you know, it's, uh, just doing it over and over again to, to, to practice sort of. Now, did either one of you work with other, like, did you work with other directors? Did he work with other cinematographers on the way up or did you always kind of together make your films and build from there? Well, I mean, I think especially at the beginning, I mean, you know, a director's on a movie for years and a cinematographer's on a movie for, uh, uh, you know, potentially weeks or months. Sure. I mean, you know, especially when you're talking about low budget stuff, that the, the difference in how long you're on something is even greater because, you know, uh, when, when you're at that stage, it's much harder for a director to get something going. And then in post, they may have, um, you know, they may have a low budget, but plenty of time so they can keep tinkering with it. And then it's got to go to festivals before it comes out. And, um, you know, so, so their time frame is in incredibly expanded, whereas my time frame would be incredibly contracted because you have even less prep, less shoot time. <laughs> yeah. Um, everything's less. So, um, you know, it took, uh, I think like six years to get brick made or something like that. And, wow. and, you know, and, um, yeah, so I definitely did some other movies in that time. I was, uh, um, you know, right out of college, I was, uh, uh, I was mostly a gaffer on really low budget stuff, uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, actually, uh, making ends meet and I would shoot stuff when I could, you know, I would shoot, 
um, you know, low budget, you know, director shorts or, or micro budget features and stuff like that when I could. Um, but then I, then I did, um, you know, while, while Ryan was still trying to get brick made, uh, you know, which we were both just so excited to, to have happen, but it, you know, it was taking a long time. I did end up doing three, uh, low budget movies, but like actual budget movies, like not just a, a homemade thing, but you know, yeah. very low budget, but actually with, you know, a crew and a budget and, and, uh, low budget for the and, industry, yeah. but for you, it, it was like, wow. Yeah, exactly. It was like actually doing it. Yeah. And then, and then that just meant I was really, really lucky, um, by the time that brick happened, because not only was, you know, not only did I have that fantastic relationship with Ryan where, you know, we, we, we'd been talking about this movie and, and, you know, in, in a sense prepping it for six years <laughs> and, you know, not, not only was that incredibly, um, close to him and to the material and, you know, just, just totally in love with it, but also, um, you know, I mean, something that happens not, not, not a hundred percent of the time, but a lot is, you know, when a, when a, a director out of film school finally gets something going, you know, they want to bring their, uh, their film school buddy as a cinematographer, and the producer's like, no way, you know, because between, you know, they're, they're like, you're already inexperienced enough. I don't want another inexperienced person um, just because they're your buddy and you're comfortable. Um, and, you know, I kind of had the opposite experience where because I had done these uh, these other uh, movies that were low budget, but actually not as low budget as Brick, you know, the producer was like, wait a minute, you can get your film school buddy who's this experienced to come do this movie for a hundred dollars a day or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I was, uh, I was kind of very lucky from multiple angles. Well, I, I was actually going to ask about that too. And I'm glad you brought it up is this idea of kind of bringing your friends along. And, um, mm -hmm. y you know, I'm curious in a situation like when you got the opportunity to shoot, um, star Wars episode eight, like that's, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get much bigger when you talk about, you know, like <laughs> movies and cinema and filmmaking. I mean, that is, you know, that's the upper echelon of filmmaking. Um, one of the most beloved stories. And, you know, um, Ryan's directing it. Um, obviously, he, he wanted to bring you in. You were brought in. You did it. Was there any resistance at all? Like, or did they say, yes, you can absolutely have Steve? Uh, well, I don't know because I, I wasn't there. I didn't, I didn't even know that. Well, I didn't. Did I, you I have didn't the even... pitch? No, no, no. I, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that Ryan had met on it, or even, you know, even met on it, let alone been given the job. I, I didn't know anything about it till he told me it was already happening, and he'd already got them to 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 uh, agree that he's bringing me and um, the editor. All right, wait a minute. How do you? Re how does one react to hearing the news <laughs> that? Guess what? I'm working on the new Star Wars film, uh, yeah. and you are too. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was it was pretty stupefying. It was. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, yeah it was quite a lot of information all at once. But um, yeah, I mean, what what I do know is that you know he he wanted to you know he was only going to do it if he could do it like one of his films. He didn't want to be a, a hired gun or a cog in the machine. Yeah, and you know, so I do know that you know that that you know, he and, and Rom, the producer that's done all of his stuff, who's, you know, very, very close partner and collaborator with Ryan, you know, if they weren't going to be able to do it their way, like with Rom pro producing it, not just as a, not just in name, but in actuality and Ryan really writing it and not being, you know, straight jacketed and where he, you know, he could really make his movie. I, I don't think he would have done it. So, um, you know, I can't speak for him, so I don't know, but I, you know, I, I don't think he would have done it. So I think once that type of a situation was set up, it was pretty obvious that, that, you know, if he's doing it his way and they really, and they really mean that, then, then of course he's going to bring the the people that he wants to bring. And that, you know, that, that doesn't mean bringing people along just because they're friends, but if he has really close collaborators, that's, and this is how he works and, and, you know, um, you know, it absolutely makes sense that, uh, that they'd not only allow, but want him to to be able to do his thing. Now, we have an audience question about Star Wars, and we will talk about it later in the show, but I want to get back to, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to get back to Knives Out. So now, Star Wars is done, it's out. Was Knives Out your next film with Ryan? It was, yeah. Well, now, talk it, about uh, a polar opposite. 
Yeah. Um, it, we, you know, we actually did a music video together for uh, LCD Sound System right before um, ah. right before the uh, Knives Out. So I guess technically it's not the next <laughs> the next film, but the next feature, yeah. Now, when this film, now you had known about it, you said 10 years prior, you heard about it. Um, yeah. How did Ryan first approach you with it? I mean, did he, I mean, what, what does he say? You guys are friendly, obviously. I'm sure he didn't have to persuade you, but what did oh, he yeah. come to you with to get you on the film? Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to do anything that Ryan, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I, lo I love his stuff, but I mean, t you know, 10 years ago, it was just an idea. It wasn't going to, you know, it wasn't even necessarily the next thing he was going to write. And obviously it wasn't <laughs> the next thing he wrote. Um, you know, I mean, he was just kind of telling it to me because he was excited about it. And, yeah. and it really was the husk of an idea. And, um, you know, what I know, you know, more, more from, you know, honestly listening to him do interviews more than even talking to him about it is it does seem like, although he was stewing on it for that long, I mean, he really did go from, you know, very, very broad strokes and sort of it germinating in the back of his head. Um, you know, he, he, he didn't really progress past that until he sat down to write it kind of a year before. So it was kind of both the slowest and the fastest script that he's, that he's written, I think, in, in terms of that he'd been, you know, thinking on it for that long. But in terms of going from the husk of an idea to an actual script, it was, I think, the fastest he's ever written anything. Now, you filmed quite a bit on location in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mostly, yeah, in the suburbs of Boston. What, what city were you in or what town? Uh, we were kind of all over the place. Um, yeah, it, we were in a kind of a crescent uh, around Boston, um, yeah, all, all around it. Well, that's where we are. We're, um, the go creative show is based in Boston and, you know, my production company is based in Boston, BC media production. So, um, you know, it's great when big films like this are coming through and we've been lucky enough to have a lot of them. Um, you know, especially in the past uh, few years because of the tax incentive to be shooting here in Massachusetts. Um, but I'm curious, did you guys look at any other places in the country before deciding on new England and Massachusetts? <laughs> No, they, um, they, they were already scouting locations before, um, I think before Ryan even finished writing the script and, um, definitely before I was on in any kind of continuous prep yeah. and they, and they just found that house and, and Ryan was like, yep, that's the house. And, and it really was about, uh, you know, that, the, you know, that was it. <laughs> the mansion is probably like the most crucial element of the film in a way like it it's it's the anchor of the whole thing like everything happens there that mansion has to be perfect and it was um oh yeah it's 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 such a huge character in the movie and you know the other thing is you know just a huge percentage of the movie takes place in and around that house both interior and exterior and if it's not right it's going to feel very you know claustrophobic and and you know uh, you know very much like a you know you know, you know, it could end up feeling like a, you know, like a, like a, a one set play if, you know, if you don't have the dynamism and, and, you know, if, if you're missing that sense of the house being such a, um, a rich character in the movie. Were all the interiors in the mansions, uh, or did you create sets on sound on sound stages? No, there were, there was some sound stage work. So, um, basically everything, um, with a couple of exceptions, everything that's on the first floor of the, of the mansion. So like the, um, you know, the, the living room and the foyer and, 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 um, uh, you know, Christopher Plummer's, uh, downstairs study, uh, not his attic study, but the downstairs study, um, all of that stuff was in the real mansion, the same mansion that's the exterior. Um, and the library, which is also on the first floor is, uh, it, on location, but in a different mansion. Hmm. And then everything that's upstairs, so both the second floor where you see everybody going into their rooms and going up the creaky stairs, and then the and then the third floor in the attic, you know, with the with the trick window and the and the and the um, the attic study and all that. The, all of that was built. So the second and third floor was all built on a stage. Um, with the exception of a couple of very brief scenes, uh, which are um, uh, Joni's room, uh, where, uh, you know, where like, you know, you see her meditating and she hears the thud Yeah, and you also, and, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that room was, uh, 
is upstairs in the world of the movie and really was upstairs in the real house. And so was Linda's bedroom, not not the bedroom that she's sleeping in, uh, but her childhood bedroom mm. is was also uh, really in the house. But besides besides those two scenes, um, everything that's upstairs was was built on the stage by um, David Crank, our uh, fantastic production designer. Which do you prefer, shooting on location or shooting in a, on a soundstage, and why? Uh, I mean, I, you know, I don't think it's a, you know, I, I, it's not one or the other, you know, you, you want to do the thing that's, that's best for, for the movie. And there are, you know, there's times where it's one and there's times where, <laughs> where it's the other, you know, but I, and, I'm, but I'm thinking like in this case where mm-hmm. you have actual locations and sound stages, both playing for the same place, uh, mm-hmm. is it, is it easier? Is it better? Is there more challenges in, in one or another? Yeah, well, I th- you know, I think we, you know, it was kind of reacting to the real world situation and doing the absolute best thing possible. And, you know, in the, I think in this case, there was no way um, on the budget that they could have constructed all of those interiors and still been able to afford all of the all of the scenicing to make them to 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 age them and, and make them textured. And then also um, all of the stuff, because. Uh, you know, the, the set dressing, even in the real location, the set dressing was enormous. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, um, and, you know, the, it, it was an amazing, you know, feat that they did that. But I, I don't think we could have afforded both in terms of building all of that and, and uh, uh, decorating it to that level of nuance. It was kind of the best of both worlds. We got all of this crazy... Um, you know, idiosyncrasy and character from this real house um, for the bulk of the scenes in there. And then, and then these scenes that really, really required, um, you know, incredible specificity that you're never going to find because, you know, Ryan had written all this stuff and he had, and, and, you know, he had it in his head from, uh, you know, from the beginning, all of that idiosyncratic stuff, like the, you know, the crazy hallway with the trick window and he, and he specifically didn't want it to make any sense, you know, cause it's a, it's a narrow hallway that doesn't lead anywhere. And then the middle of it has a 90 degree door going upstairs to another door with no landing. The stairs go right to the door yeah, yeah. and then it's the attic. And so that's a crazy thing that's highly specific. And he wanted it to be exactly all of those things. Um, you, you know, you, even though, you know, even though, um, David Crank and his team designed it, I mean, Ryan had the specificity of that layout, um, in his head and it was pretty essential to, to, you know, in in some cases, you know, the, the, the mechanics of the story, but definitely to the feel, uh, um, uh, you know, and, and what that space means to, um, both Marta and, and Harlan. So, um, you know, there, there was just no way they were, you know, were ever going to find, that that third floor and attic, I, you know, they, they made an effort to find the second floor, but it, you know, that just didn't work either because you've got to be able to see, uh, you know, all, all in one shot. Basically, you have to be able to see people going into their bedrooms. You have to see the the the, the downstairs, uh, um, you know, that the uh, um, that the foyer stairs leads to that landing, but you also have to see that the creaky stairs are right there too, and and they're just you know. That was, there was just never going to be anything that met all of those geographic requirements and also looked like it was in that same house. You know, we, we actually looked at a lot of locations for that and it just, it wasn't going to happen. So, so they ended up building that. So for this film, can you tell me what you're looking for in the location that you selected? Like, obviously you want to make sure it, it looks right for the story, but are there any other things that you look for as a cinematographer that we may not know? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, uh, you, you know, again, it's like you don't start out with a rule of what you're looking for. You know, you, you have to, uh, you know, you have to be flexible and, and, you know, be receptive, not just start with an idea and then, uh, you know, force a square, po- uh, square peg in a round hole, no matter what. Yeah. But, you know, I, you know, I knew what sense Ryan wanted. And, you know, when I was first kind of just, uh, you know, when I was first starting talking to them seriously about it being a production, or not, you know, an actual movie being made and not just an idea of Ryan's, you know, when I was talking to him and the and, and Ron, the producer and everybody, you know, I was a little hesitant of, you know, we have so much dialogue, you know, so many pages upon pages inside of this house. And, you know, and also Ryan loves doing 
energetic camera moves and all kinds of stuff. And not, and not only does he, you know, love doing that in general, but to keep this thing from, you know, becoming too sedentary, we want, we want to be able to do a lot of stuff. And is it, you know, and I, and, you know, and I was actually slightly worried, are we going to be hemming ourselves in with these locations where we can't fly walls and, and, you know, also houses that are that old, even when they're huge mansions, they don't usually actually have huge rooms. They just have a lot of rooms. Yeah. <laughs> so there's yeah. not, there's not necessarily a ton of space to move the camera around and, and to, you know, back up to be able to see a lot of actors at the same time and do uh, moves. And, you know, so uh, that was a concern, but I also understood that Ryan wants all of this incredible character. And if they really found a unique thing with this house, um, and it's something that uh, our production designer, who's brilliant, is telling us, you know, this is the best way you're going to get this. That if I, you know, use the money another way in terms of building, it's going to get spread thin and you're not going to get as much value. You know, you got you got to um, appreciate that, that he's the expert in that. So, you know, we went and we went and looked at it and, you know, I, I was like, you know, the, the, the light here is just absolutely beautiful. Like the, the, this, the, the way the windows are and the way that the, indirect light comes in through the windows and you know we were looking at it in uh i think it was summertime but knowing we were going to shoot there in winter and thinking it's going to be even more amazing and evocative for the feel of the movie when it's this winter steely light yeah coming in so you know i, I just kind of went over with ryan and it's like are you sure it's okay like you know some shots we may not be able to get exactly the shot if we have to back up against the wall or we may it might be on a wider lens and you know also things are going to be a little bit you know it's a little bit slower because you know it's like you got to move stuff, you know, everything's got to go in and out through the door. So if you, if we're going to turn around in the, in a room, it's like, okay, let's, we got to take the camera out. Then we got to take the furniture we were just looking at out. Then we got to take the furniture we're going to look at in. Then we got to bring the camera back in. You know, it's a little bit of the, the tile puzzle. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, those, t those puzzles that are the little tiles that you have to move around. Yeah, so, absolutely. You, you know, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, just making sure Ryan knew that, you know, yes, this is worth it. We know what we're, you know, we know what we're in for with this. And, um, you know, he was all for it. And then, and then, you know, I got excited because the house is absolutely beautiful and, and the light is beautiful. And so, you know, I kind of went down the road of, you know, uh, you know, when you're shooting long scenes, long dialogue scenes, um, you know, you, you, you need some kind of continuity, of course. So it feels like you're in the same, the same time. And, you know, one, one of the default ways of doing that is even if you have beautiful natural light coming through the windows, you know, you might end up basically blocking out the real beautiful light and putting up a bunch of big movie lights just so that it doesn't, <laughs> uh, change, you know, and that you can control it. And, um, you know, I really wanted to, figure out a way not to do it that way and to really get that that steely moody light that the house really had so you know it was a combination of um uh you, you know we used uh you know we used the master primes which are pretty fast lenses as our primes and you know we had a lot of zooming shots because of ryan's you know the the evolving shots where you hand off from one character to another as people are moving around and so yeah. forth. Um, so the zooms were a little bit slower. So if we were doing a scene where, you know, I really needed that speed out of the primes, I'd kind of say to Ryan in advance, "Is it okay if I light this scene for the uh, where it's only primes?" And you know, and he'd say yes or he'd say no. But uh, you know, so so the you know we really tried to just use the real window light and uh, use the speed of the lenses and the camera to not have to amplify it even as it got towards the end of the day. And then, and then the way to match it as it was shifting, because the color would change throughout the day, um, you know, we would use a spectrometer to measure the hard color of, you know, like this is not um, subjective movie stuff like RGB colors. This is, you know, the hard science of, um, of uh, you know, uh, spectrometry where we, you know, actually measure the, col the color of the window light. And then if we're matching that with a sky panel, let's say, you know, because we don't want it to look like the light in the room is artificial or, sure, that, yeah. or that, you know, and we also need it to shift with the, uh, with the light of the window so it doesn't look like it's changing. So we would, uh, so then the light in the room, we would, um, if it was a sky panel, we were able to match it to the window uh, because sky panels already accept XY coordinates, which is the uh, chromaticity coordinates from, 
again, from hard, hard color science, not just subjective uh, movie stuff. Um, so with the sky panels, we were able to just dial the color in. But then we also had all these lights that we had built um, out of LED tape that were these really lightweight, um, you, you know, again, because the, the rooms were so small and, and it was hard to move gear around in there and have space for gear. We had these, these lights we had built that were very lightweight and f- flat because they were just LED tape. Uh, in various sizes from small, like, you know, I don't know, maybe six inch square all the way up to, you know, four four or five feet uh, squares or rectangles. And um, I I had uh, devised a little calculator um, uh, that I had on my phone where we could uh, just type in the chromaticity coordinate of the window and it would tell us what blend to put into those lights to make them that color since they don't have the um, the controllers that air, that the sky panels do to, to automatically, you know, uh, you can't just type the X, Y coordinate in. So th- basically this little calculator would tell us what blend of the illuminance of the five illuminants in the lamp to create that color. That is crazy. I was going to ask that because I know that those LED tape really is what I would call mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah. they don't have as much control as like a sky panel or something. So that, okay. So you have your spectrometer, you're getting the exact coordinates of the color that you want. <clears throat> yeah. Put that into the sky panel and you're changing it throughout the day. Um, yes. Depending yeah. On- so we're, yeah. So we're chasing it so that it doesn't change so that it, so that the, the relationship of the, of the uh, light inside to the window light stays the same. So it's not necessarily the same color, but the relationship between the color stays the same. Like if, you know, like if the inside, sometimes it is the same color, but for example, if the, interior is let's just say warmer and greener or something than the exterior we want it to always be the same amount warmer and greener so we need to chase it as it as it changes i want to take a quick break and talk about what i think is the best and most important tool for final cut pro 10 users the best and most important tool post lab yes post lab PostLab is a collaboration tool for Final Cut Pro 10, and it enables users to share libraries, to track and save changes. And PostLab also makes sure that no more than one person is working on a library at the same time. So that means you get zero conflicts. You also get a recallable history of your project. Now, you can get three months free, um, three months of PostLab for free, by going to gocreativeshow.com forward slash PostLab. But before you even go there, I want you to know couple of things about it. One, it's a cloud service, but it's also a desktop app. What I mean by that is this, PostLab always works off the local copy. So you don't have to worry about having internet access to work on your libraries. So you really don't change the way you've been working on your library. It just adds this additional layer of um, collaboration that you haven't had before up until now, and you are going to love once you have it. They're also using a cloud service that is made for Final Cut libraries. Now, if any of you have put libraries on cloud services in the past, you know that it can be a little bit dicey. Not with PostLab. They have perfected it, and now you get a stress-free collaboration experience with zero conflicts. So it is something to try. And the good news is you get three months free simply by going to gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. Gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab. We love those guys. And I know you will too. So if you're using Final Cut Pro 10, head over to gocreativeshow.com forward slash postlab and get your three free months of postlab. So when you made these LED, you, you have LED tape, what are you mm-hmm. mounting it on? Uh, so the, yeah, so, um, so uh, Josh Davis was our amazing gaffer and he... Um, he and his crew and he, and he, uh, you know, made these lights in advance. So they were, they were already built and, and ready to go. So they had, um, uh, I can't remember what, you know, I, I'm not sure what it was mounted on. It was something that was very lightweight and flat and, um, you know, all the, all the circuitry in them was done. Uh, you, you know, he had like a, he has a specialist who does that stuff. So it's actually properly sort of like, um, uh, integrated into the light. So it's not like just a bunch of heavy cables sagging, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's actually sort of, um, 
you know, uh, yeah, so it's like really professionally done. So it's all very lightweight and it's not, you know, and it doesn't have a bunch of wires hanging off of it. So, yeah, I mean, it's basically just a big rectangle with the tape on it and it already has diffusion. So we're not adding diffusion. It's got, um, uh, you know, we used uh, um, Depron, which is like a thin, flexible foam stuff. And so, yeah. Put it right on top. Yeah. And it's just already on. So it's not like we're stretching it across every time. It's like, that's just how the light is. It's already soft. How much of an advantage was it than just getting like, you know, light panels or um, like, uh, the, what are they called? The, um, oh my God, I'm, I use them all the time. They're the one by two, like light pads. Yeah. I can't, I, I can't think of the so word. Many, there are so many brands of them. Um, like Astara, uh, Astara does a bunch of them. Um, yeah. Uh, Aladdin yeah, I mean, does a bunch of, like what, what was the, cause those are pretty thin. So yeah. I mean, how much space did that afford you to build your own with the light tape? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was a, you know, I think there were a few things involved. One is that, um, you know, you, you know, you can make it even lighter and flatter because, you know, th- those things all have to be like uh, underwriter approved and, yeah, and all yeah. of that for safety. So, so, you know, they do get heavier and thicker and more solid just because of that. I mean, but if you literally just have LED tape plugged into a controller and just something that supports it, that can be incredibly light and flat. So, so I think there was um, some amount, uh, you know, of, of it being lighter and flatter and us being able to make any um, shape and size that we yeah, wanted. That flexibility, and, I, I can yeah, imagine, and, would be great. And, and the other thing is, and, and we didn't, you know, we didn't dive too deep into it because it just made sense to do this. I mean, it, I don't even know, but I'm guessing that it was also cheaper to do it because by the time you just buy some tape as opposed to renting those things for the whole time, I'm guessing it's actually cheaper, although I don't really know. Um, but, you, you know, the other thing is I don't know whether... I don't know which ones of those things have options where it actually has RGB W, not just, you know, because a lot of them are just bicolor, which means they have two whites um, you know, they have, they basically have a daylight and a, and a tungsten, which means yeah. if you want to, and, and you can just blend between the two, which means you can't match any color at all. You, you, you're sliding on a, of, you know, of the two dimensional chromaticity, uh, you know, map or whatever you want to call it, the, you know, the CIE hall, um, you know, to make any color, you have to be able to move two dimensionally, but here, you know, if, if it only has two illuminants, you're only moving one dimensionally along a line, uh, like, you know, if you want to need to dial some more green into it or something, you can't do that. Yeah. So I don't know how many of them have RGBW or RGBWW. And then, and then they need to also be, if they don't have an XY, uh, a properly worked out XY um, system in their controller, like the sky panels do, then we need them to have, uh, then the only way for, for my calculator to work is you need to be able to control it where you can control the, the, however many illuminants it has four or five, three, four or five or whatever, you need to be able to control them separately and totally linearly, you know, and, you know, linearly, literally meaning like if you send a hundred percent of the power, uh, you know, if you send a DMX value of a hundred percent, which is 255 to one of the, uh, illuminants, um, and then you send, you know, 50%, then it, then it's exactly half as bright. Or if you send 25%, then that's half as bright again. Hmm. Um, you need it to be, so you need to be able to control the illuminance separately and in a perfectly linear way um, for the, for this calculator that I developed uh, to, to properly be able to tell us the blends. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I just, I don't know how many of those things actually have that. And uh, I don't know, I just felt like we weren't about to get into a thing of, of, testing all of them and then you get into a, you know further issues of if we want different sizes are those two different brands and then they're different and you know. yeah. so this was just it was all the same stuff for all the sizes it's math people just just trust it <laughs> <laughs> exactly. we got a question on on instagram from sweensy uh s-w-e-e-n-s-e-y on instagram he's talking about this thing now i don't know where he got this information but i hope it's true he's asking about the window frames that your key grip made for glasses reflections. Does this make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, tell, tell well, first of all, tell us about what this is and uh, good find, Sweensy. I had no idea what you were talking about, so I'm glad it worked. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've got, um, and actually, if you uh, 
do a, a little search on Twitter there, you can see some images of this that really illustrate both the behind the scenes, how we did it and the results. But um, yeah, we had a lot of characters with, with glasses um, and with eyeglasses and, um, you know, and, uh, you know, of course, a lot of, uh, you know, close ups and medium close ups and stuff because it's uh, there's there's a lot of dialogue. And um, so, yeah, we just kind of got into this thing where, you know, it, it, it started with with one specific scene where I was like, um, uh, hey, Matt, could you, you know, can you basically get some paper tape and just make this forced perspective, um, you know, uh, you know, ba- basically create a mask to put onto our big diffuser. We had a big diffusion bag, you know, that goes on the sky panel or whatever. Mm. And I'm looking was, at I'm looking at it right now on your on your Twitter. Oh, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this so, looks awesome. Yeah. So I so I just took the so I actually took the top photo uh, that you see there, which is what would be you know, which is what's actually what's out in front of Daniel Craig. So that could be believably reflected in his glasses. And I just took that photo and I gave it to Matt and I said, "Can you just mask off the the um, the diffusion the diffusion bag into this shape so that if we if he's as he's moving his head around if we see it reflected it just looks like what should actually be there and he's and he was like, "Yeah, sure, I can I can do that." So he did it and it worked great. And then um, uh, you know, next thing he knew, I was asking him to do it, stuff like that all the time. <laughs> Uh, with, you know, making all kinds of window mullions and, and different things. And, you know, and sometimes they were literally exactly what should actually be reflected. And sometimes they were more like, a, you know, slightly impressionistic of the type of sort of vague thing that might be reflected um, in that space. So, um, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for example, in the, in the scene where uh, with Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, who, who plays Linda, when we're in Linda's childhood bedroom, and Walt comes in and she's looking at the, at the letters, um, from Harlan, uh, you know, in that case, we actually had really the exact mullion shape that would have actually been reflected in her glasses. Um, you know, we, you know, uh, Matt, Matt made that exact shape of what the, what that real window there looked like. And that's, what's reflected. But then other times we would do, you know, t- it would be a little, take a little more, um, creative Liberty with it and just make it some type of window that might be in front of the person, um, uh, you know, to reflect in their glasses. We get a great question from Tyler Stallman. Um, uh, he wants to know, uh, he says, Steve has created incredibly useful resources about color science and how to capture format and how the capture format is less important than the preparation. Um, where can an average cinematographer fill in knowledge gaps so that we understand color beyond the sliders. I like this idea of understanding color beyond our sliders in the software. And you talked a little bit about that before, where it's not just the um, uh, subjective color, it's the mm. sciencey color. What I think he's asking for here is uh, a resource, maybe, to help us as you know filmmakers learn a little bit more. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, I have people ask me this a lot, and unfortunately, there isn't one resource um, that, that has all of that stuff. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I really slowly learn stuff over the course of a long time from various things. You know, you learn, you learn one thing just by fiddling with it. You learn just one little nugget of a detail from a, from a, you know, a color space, uh, you know, spec sheet or something, you, you know, um, but, uh, you know what, that's part of why I, I have all the resources I have on my website is that, you know, that is the only sort of, consolidated thing like that, that I, that I, <laughs> that I know of that, that does try to make it where, you know, you don't have to do years and years and years of math or something to, um, to get there. You know, of, of course that means it's not complete. It still is kind of an overview top level for most of it, but, you know, the, you know, connecting the, I, I don't know of anything that connects the gap from the top level down to the, to the fine grain you know, all of the actual math. I don't know if there is anything in between, you know, it's It's almost like experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like you either have to just, you know, look at the top level and then collaborate with the color scientist at your post house or whatever, or you do need to just dig in and start learning all the fine grain stuff. You know, you can, you know, you can, you know, you get some software like, um, like nuke, or I used to use shake or, you know, fusion, or something like that, where you can, where you can have direct, you know, 
access to to the code values in individual pixels, and you can also, um, you know, you can also manipulate them mathematically, where you're not just using, um, you know, you're not just using a plugin where you don't understand what it does, but you can actually type the math to manipulate this stuff, and then you can start to, you know, that's where you start to have that hands-on feeling for it instead of it being a distant, vague concept. Yeah. It's kind of like the idea of, um, you know, coloring to the um, uh, to the graphs and not the image. Like looking at your, mm -hmm. looking at your meters, looking at your waveforms before you even look at the image and, and coloring to that. I think, it, Tyler, it sounds like this is a perfect opportunity. The gap should be filled by you. Make a resource, <laughs> make a website. It's, it seems like, uh, it seems like this is a good opportunity for you to to pull together some resources for us, because this, that I think would be really valuable for people. Um, I want to talk about the look of the film. This mm -hmm. film tricked me, I got to say. I didn't uh -huh. read much about, um, you know, the making of it or anything before I saw it. I usually never do. Um, mm -hmm. I really thought it was shot on film. I think this is probably one of the most truly cinematic, quote unquote, I even hate saying that, but what, it looks so filmic. I was absolutely blown away by you guys, how you guys achieved that. Um, so first, I'd love to know, um, and it's a great question from uh, Hey Bruce Wright on, Tr on Twitter. Um, did you have any films that you were referencing when you were creating this? Um, and I guess we'll start there. Um, yeah, so, uh, you, you know, look, I, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I actually think it's a little bit exhausting that in, in uh, the year 2020, we're still talking about which uh cameras we're using to get a look. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like uh, an author talking about which word processing software they type in to get their feel of their novel. I mean, it's, it's, at, at that's a great, point, rep. that's a, that's a great comparison, you, you know, because at this point in time, and, and I have all this stuff on my website and it's all public record. And, and I, I, you know, I go way deep into it there. So I don't want to spend too much time on it because it is like talking about which word processor an author types in. At, at this point, but but you know we you know we we do have this uh, preconceived notion that that get, that that gets circulated as a superstition, you know, despite the evidence that um, you know that a major leverage point for the look is the selection of camera type, and it, it it's just really not true. And, you know, we the the way that the colors are rendered and, you know, even the way that um, fine edge detail and all of that stuff, the, the way that the actual pure scene information, like what's actually coming in through the lens, the way that gets rendered into a photographic image, you know, whether it's more clinical and correct or whether it's more artful and in which ways it's that, um, you know, all of this is defined in the, in the, in the, in the color pipeline. It just is whether whether we admit it or not, and really, when people think that they're gra taking control of uh, of that by choosing a camera brand or model or whatever, um, what they're really doing is just not taking control of it, and they're and they're using whatever off the shelf stuff is is somebody is handing them to do the actual transformations that make that make the look. So, for example. You know, people think that the my you know many people think that the, the quote the Alexa has a look and but that look is really just the the manufacturer recommended lookup table for taking the uninterpreted data and preparing it for a look on the screen. But there's no there's no reason to use that one as opposed to any other one. Um, and 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 you, you know, and also sometimes people phrase it as though you know, film inherently looks like that. So, you know, why don't you, quote, just shoot on film uh, instead of, you know, doing all this work to, quote, emulate film? And, you know, that that question also comes from somebody who doesn't have to actually do the color science themselves because film doesn't magically do anything. People, scientists, many hundreds and thousands of scientists worked on it for over 100 years at Kodak and Fuji and at the labs and at all these different places uh, to make it work. And they were developing that transformation that takes the uninterpreted image record, uh, which in the case of film is a negative and, and prepares it to be shown. And it may have felt like the only, you know, in the past, it may have felt like the only way you could, um, you know, the, the, your, your major leverage point was to pick a different film stock or something because you couldn't change that way that the, that uh, the image record was interpreted to be displayed. 
Um, you know, because you couldn't like invent your own film, you, you know, your own print stock or your own intermediate stock or whatever, you know, I mean, you, you had to use the ones that existed. The thing is today, you know, not, not only can you, you actually have to, and there, there's no locked down system for interpreting any image record. And that includes film, not, and not only includes film, it's more so with film because film, not, not only is it uninterpreted to begin with, because the negative, I mean, think about it, a negative doesn't have a look. If you put a negative in a projector, it's backwards and flat and orange. And you know that's, yeah, yeah. that's not the look. You need something that interprets the look, which is the print stock. Um, and now we're even far, like not only do we not use the print stock that was the way that it was always interpreted, we now have a scanner in, interposing, uh, y- you know, another set of, of variables that are not a final look, but just a, a, you know, another set of unknown variables getting added in. So no matter what format you shoot on, it's really that, um, that transformation from whatever the, the image record is to how it's displayed. That's going to make that, that photographic look. And, um, you know, I've just put a lot of work into actually, uh, you know, designing the one that we use rather than, than, you know, using one of the, one of the off the shelf, uh, solutions for that. So you must be intimately involved in the color grading, um, throughout, you know, all your films. You must be, it sounds like you're super passionate about this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, On the one hand, absolutely. Yes. But on the other hand, because this, um, you know, the, you know, I'm talking about like what we were just now talking about is sort of that core transformation that takes the, the, you know, like what you're talking about, like making custom LUTs for on set. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Pretty much. Uh, yeah. And you know, that's how do you, uh, that and other, you know, LUTs can only do per pixel stuff. So if you want to do spatial, you need other algorithms, but yes. And, and, um, you know, so it, so that's the core transfer. I mean, that's like inventing a print stock. You know what I mean? Like you yeah. don't, uh, like Kodak doesn't invent a different print stock for every scene or every shot or every movie that has a different look. You know what I mean? There's only there, you know, in the heyday of that stuff, there was only two or three print stocks and now there's only one, um, you know, so every movie of every different look uses the same, that complex transformation. You're going to use the same thing for everything. It needs to be a good one, but then you use it for everything. So we, so on the one hand, you know, I, you know, I do all this work up front, you, you know, uh, so that we have this one transformation that we're going to use for everything. Um, so then the, so then the color grading actually is very simple where we keep it to just really simple kind of printer light adjustments. Um, you know, our colorist on, uh, Knives Out was, uh, Aiden Stanford, who I've known for a long time. And he, he actually used to be a film timer of mine. He's one of the few, uh, digital colorists that used to be a film timer so he has this amazing eye for that nuance, you know, really small, uh, you know, just really dialing things in for beautiful skin tones and beautiful matching and all that. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're really able to use our time for him to do that thing that he's really good at because we're not trying to uh, reinvent the wheel. You know what I mean? We're not spending our limited time in color grading, creating the image from scratch you know, like from a blank slate, like, you know, we're trying to create it out of nothing. So you spend all this time on the broad strokes with no time for finesse. We're not doing any of that. It's all finesse work um, because it comes in already with the overall broad strokes, exactly how we want it. So he, he can do all that, that nuance work that really just brings it to the next level. So what do you, like, what is your, what's your process for developing this up front? Like it's, a, it, you, you had just mentioned a minute ago that you go even beyond custom lots. Like you're doing more than that. Um, so do you like start work with the colorist at the beginning or is this something that you work with different, you know, a different team with, or, uh, like how, yeah, how I mean, does it begin? How do you, how do you actually work on this? Well, for, well, for the core color transformation, it's just something I've been working on for, for years and years and years where it's slowly developing. And it's not even specific to the look of one, uh, particular movie because, you know, the, the look of the movie does come from you know, the look of the particular movie does come from like all the lighting and lensing and all the, all the authoring that we do and all of the details of it. It doesn't come from some overall thing like the, how do you, you know, interpret, um, you you know, the, 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 you know, how do you take the uninterpreted scene information and and show that photographically like that, you know, that, that, that can be a pretty blanket thing for, across movies or across different scenes within movies. So I've been kind of 
developing and refining how I do that for years, uh, you know, with new, n- new data sets, new math, you know, like, uh, I think about maybe three or four years ago, I threw out all of the math I was using to do it and then re redid, you know, basically recreated the same thing with, with different math that looked almost the same, but was just smoother. So that if you had, uh, you know, like if you had a really saturated color, you know, like the, the way something would ramp into a really saturated color would just be a little bit smoother. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's so, just, so like when you're making that, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm just want to, and this is probably a dumb question. I, uh, I do many of them, so I'm not worried about it, <laughs> um, but like how are, I guess, how are you implementing this math mm-hmm. into the camera? Is it through a LUT or is it something in the yeah. settings in the camera yeah. or, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so, a, so a LUT is an interchange format and it can, and it's basically just a way, it, it, you know, it's um i mean it literally is it's let stands for lookup table and yeah. it really is a lookup and it's a it's a complete list of basically all the colors that could come in for this input color what's the output color so it's just it's just a way to interchange a transformation it's not the development of a transformation you know like uh um you know an analogy would be you know uh, you know uh I'll, I'll, you know to to go back to our writers analogy yeah. um you know a lut is like 100 pieces of paper like you could have a script on 100 pieces of paper but they could also be blank or it could be a bunch of x's or it could say all work and no play makes jack a dull boy <laughs> i was waiting for that reference <laughs> and uh, you, you know um you know so a lut is really just a con- is just a is just a container like the fact that you ha- you know people are like i have a lut and then they, they think that means it ha- you know that has something deep in it but it doesn't you can literally save any tr- you can save or interchange any transformation as a lut including a good one a bad one a simple one a complicated one sure um anything at all so basically the math that I'm talking about is for the development of a transformation, you know, to figure out what it is that you want to have happen because we need a lot more complex, nuanced stuff than what you can do with like, you know, lift gamma gain and HSV keys uh, to, to, to make something that's as, as nuanced and rich as what you get from, you know, like when you print negative onto a print stock. And so, so, like, but, you know, but like, where does that development get made? Like, where, what is the product of that development? Is that, it, the development so, you're talking about, is that within the details of the lookup table or is it something else that's applied? So, yeah, so it's, it's uh, so, you know, you're ta- I'm taking, I mean, the way I'm doing it, I mean, people do it different ways, is I'm taking rigorously derived data sets and, I've you know, I've got all this, you know, like I said, my own math that I use, I don't use any of these, you know, any off the shelf plugins or anything to develop the transformation. I mean, this is literally when you say like, where is it being done? It's being done in math. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, okay. and, then, and then any transformation that you develop, no matter how complicated it is, you can then store it as a LUT and any, anything that can read a LUT can read it. So like, for example, um, uh, okay, like, like th- this is just a, like an oversimplified example, but if um, like on my website, one of those resources that I was talking about is uh, is the follow up to the display prep demo, and in that I talk about um, a way to um, like a, a, a three a, a three a way to basically attack colors in a three dimensional way that has some nuance to it, but it's a lot smoother and more. Um, you know, you can go farther than you can with like a, you know, HSV type keying uh, without it tearing the image apart. Um, that, and I call that thing Tetra. Okay. That, that, the, that kind of algorithmic thing that you can use different parameters to adjust the color cube. I, I call it Tetra. So if, so to actually use Tetra, you would have to have that, um, you know, um, You'd have to have that all of that math, that algorithm ported into some software. So, like you know, uh, you could write a plugin uh, for Resolve that does that math, or you could write a plugin for Open Effects that does that, or or whatever. Um, so, so to actually use Tetra itself, you would need that to be coded for whatever software you're working in. But you don't yeah. need to do that for a LUT. So, if you if you make a if if you take Tetra and you put certain parameters into it, you can't change the parameters, you put certain parameters into it, then you can save that as a LUT. Now any 
software that can read a LUT can now do that transform, even though it, it even though it can't do Tetra, because all your all your yeah. all, all your all your all you're putting in the LUT is what the transformation is, not how you derived it. Yeah, I, that makes sense. That makes sense. The distinction between the two, and we've been talking about your website a lot, so I just want to plug it properly. Yedlin.net. Y e d l i n dot net. There's a lot of resources here. It is much more than just a cinematographer's website. Certainly, you have your work there, but you also have a lot about color science. You have that display prep demo that you talked about. There's there's a ton there, so it's a great resource for you guys to check out. Yedlin dot net. Let's take a quick break and talk about Rule Boston Camera. Now, Rule is a place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. Now, there's a couple reasons why. One, they have a gigantic inventory. Think about it. When Hollywood films and commercials come through town, Boston, uh, they use Rule. And they use Rule because they have the best inventory around. But they also use Rule for the same reason that I do, which is you get amazing service. Amazing service. You're going to get expert advice and counsel in pre-production. You're going to get technical guidance when you take the equipment out on your shoot. And they're committed to support you the whole time you're on location, the whole time you have their gear. They are really a production partner for you. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to just explain it in an ad like this. But when you work with them, you truly do feel this way. You feel that they are just as invested in the project as you are. That, that's, a, that's a good feeling. Having support from your production partner is huge. And that's what Rule Boston Camera is. They are your production partner. So check them out for yourself and experience the Rule way at rule.com, R-U-L-E dot com. I want to talk about camera movement. Um, mm-hmm. I thought the movement in this film was just so well done, so like precise. It felt Like every move was motivated and not just motivated because it was a cool shot, but motivated by the story, what was going on at the moment, the performances. It was just excellent. And I want to talk to you about your decision to move the camera and what are the things that help you make that decision? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, Ryan's just a master of the of the cinematic language, and you know, I mean, uh, he he and I both have really similar tastes. But I mean, you know, uh, of course, the actual detail and nuance of of all of it, you know, to to a large, to you know, mostly comes from him. I mean, you know, he holds the director's finder and says, you know, <laughs> this is where we want to, you know, let's start here and do a push into there uh, or whatever. But he but he and I both love that every frame tells a story. You know, it's it, camera movements not about white noise or about um, novelty for its own sake or, or anything like that. So, you know, we, you know, we both love an exuberant camera, but where it's, it's, you know, the design of it is really to, to tell the, the story in the most, you know, visually exciting way. And, um, you know, uh, when you start, you know, when you start getting into the nuances of it, you know, uh, as opposed to the general, because there's the general design, like, you know, this shot's going to be a push in or that, uh, you know, another shot's going to be a, you know, we're, we're panning with somebody and then we, but we catch somebody else and start zooming and then we dolly and pan with someone else or, or, you know, there, there, there's kind of the, the, the big conceptual idea of it like that. But then when you get into the nuances of it, you know, that also gets into the, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, coordinated and reactive dance with the actors, you know, and, um, and exactly what they're doing. And, uh, you know, we had, we had a fantastic, uh, Dolly grip on the movie, Billy, who, you know, you know, he's, he's done it for a long time and he, you know, and he really knows how to, how to feel, you know, like also, you know, once we say this is what the shot is, he, he, you know, he, he understands the, the underlying concept of it, not just the, you know, he's not just robotically repeating the same thing. So if the actors do something different, he's not going to robotically do the same thing. He's going to do like the equivalent of what the concept was, but for this you know, for whatever happened differently, um, you know, and, and a lot of it really is just feeling the the performance and, and the pacing of the scene and all that. Cause you know, there, there's so many times where, you know, we, you know, like, uh, you know, like I'll say to Ryan, like, should the dolly be just a hair slower? And he's like, yeah, I was about to say that to you, you know, cause, it, and, and, you know, it's not because of some rule or, or something you can look up in a, in a textbook. It's just, you know, it's you're feeling, feeling it's just the feel, yeah, of, of 
you know, that the, you know, what's happening in the scene and the actor's cadence and posture and, and all of that, you know. Mm. Can you give us just, uh, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to, um, I just want to get like a little bit of a breakdown on mm. one of the scenes or one of the shots in Knives Out that was particularly challenging or rewarding or something that you had to overcome. Can you break down a scene for us, um, you know, briefly in, in our last couple of minutes? Yeah, well, I think um, something that, that was really, really fun for me, um, and this is also another thing that uh, if you go online, you can actually see these these images um, of what went into it, not just the final result. Um, on your Twitter, it, you're talking about? On, on Twitter, yeah, um, which is uh, we did, uh, there's a bunch of scenes around the house that are um, either uh, dusk for night or they're, uh, they're actually a visual effects composite of day for night and night for night, or, you know, or they're dusk for night with some visual effects elements. And, um, this was all stuff that, that was, you know, very intentionally designed to get this really specific type of impressionistic night that, um, I mean, it's the kind of thing I've been wanting to do for a really long time, but there, there's not always a way to do it where, you know, on the one hand, you see all the the electric light and the, and, the, and the light in the house that's, you know, that actually has an effect, which if you just shot day for night and you turn a light bulb on, obviously that's not going to have any effect. Yeah. Um, but, you, but at the same time that you're seeing the light that the electric lights are actually bright as they would be at night, that you see, uh, you know, the top of the house, which should be unlit, very dark against the, the that deep blue sky. And you also see, and then the the trees because they're in a, you know, in this, uh, you know, this country house and there's all the trees around them and the forest behind them, which, you know, in, in real life would be unlit. And the way you would usually see that would be black trees against, you know, you can just barely see that light glowing in the sky. That's what you see from moonlight yeah at night. Um, but usually in movies, you know, if you actually shoot at night, what you see is front lit trees against a black sky, not black trees against a dimly lit sky. And, um, so this was just a way that, uh, that I came up with to blend these in different ways. And, um, I actually did the composites myself on my, on my laptop. Um, so I, so I kind of, for each one and, you know, and, and it wasn't, you know, like several of these things we're talking about, it wasn't a rule. It wasn't like, here's the method and it's a recipe. It, it was, you know, shot to shot and circumstance to circumstance. Like, Oh, you know, we thought it was going to be overcast, but it's actually sunny. Um, or whatever. And I, and I would kind of, you know, kind of figure out, okay, I know this is how I want to do it. And, and, it, you know, it was different. The, the exact method was different for all of them, but, but yeah, we have all these, these composites where, you know, we would shoot the multiple elements and then, and then I put them together in my computer and exactly that, that way I wanted. And, and the, the, the one that's the, um, and, and there's a whole bunch of them, but the, but the one that I, it's in the image that I put on Twitter kind of is the best example of um, a full, uh, you know, day for night, just full on front sunlit day for night. Um, there's a, and then there's a night for night. There, there's actually a whole bunch of night for night elements, but I, I only put one on there. So, you know, I had all the windows and stuff to pick from that are all lit up. Mm. We had shot. Um, and in the example, it's got, um, it's got Chris going uh, across, you know, it's, it's when he goes through the gate and up to the house and you see, um, uh, you know, and, uh, so, you know, so we had elements of the porch. Uh, and, 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 and around- I just, I just want to make sure just so that the audience is understanding. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about compositing a shot that you took during the day and yeah. a shot that you took at night. Yes. And almost like the way, oh, what is that effect in photography where you comp different exposures? What oh, is HDR. That? No, oh, it, that's, well, not, that's... not to say that it's HDR, but it's the idea of taking two different, you know, differently lit shots of the same exact frame. Am I right? Yes, but it's not blending it because uh, they did call that HDR. That's a different HDR than what we we mean by HDR, but that is what they called it. Um, okay, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about the multiple exposure blend. Yeah, it's not it's not it, it it's it's not like that because what that's doing is it's blending the entire shot so that you have all of these. You, you know, like if if some one area was too dark in the one exposure, you see it in the other, and it's this sort of. Um, I mean, it actually is kind of mechanical and surreal looking. Um, uh, I mean, it can be cool, but it's a different thing. This is, this is, uh, I guess this is, I don't, not surreal. It's more, uh, like I said, impressionistic. 
because I mean, uh, probably don't have enough time to get into this. I think well, that anything is it that's, just that, that like it's it's allowing you to select which elements you want to use, right? Well, I mean, I had to select when I was doing it because the, the you know that it, it, it's not a thing where it's like okay, if we have this, then we can do anything we want later. Okay. It's more like it, it's 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 actually doing it exactly the way that I would light any scene. Like a, take a scene that's not visual effects. The way you light it is you're like, well, I want this part of the screen to be light, that's part to be dark. You know what I mean? Like you, you know, you don't want to do a big front light because that's going to light up. You know, that's going to fill in the dark side of the face and put a shadow on the wall and. And all that, you know, you, you know, and, that, and that's how you decide how to do your lighting is what you want it to look like, you yeah. know? Yeah. And then, and then, and then that's what it looks like. And and this is actually the same thing where, you know, I'm actually designing the thing to, to a very good extent in my head. Like, you know, again, in that example that we can, that, that um, you know, that we can see him and we can see the front lawn uh, and, but, but it's dark and, you know, the place where the sun was throwing shadows is going to be you know, very dark and the place where the sun was hitting is going to be dark and not look like sun. And, but I also know that, um, I want the top of the house to be dark against a lit sky, uh, instead of front lit, because if you like in the, in the night for night element, you can actually see the movie light that's lighting up the house and the roof is really bright, which is not yeah, what we want. Yeah. And, you know, we also have a light front lighting the trees, which is how it would usually look in a movie night exterior, but that's not what we want. So, so I knew exactly what the thing is. So it's it's shooting the exact elements that I know that I need to do the composite later to to get that. So you just kind of planted your camera, got the shot during the day, and you just did you just leave a camera there and wait for the evening? No, no, we just we we just marked the position and the height and brought it back. There, 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 for for that effect, there's no need for it to be some kind of hard lock off. It really okay, so it can be, be okay. Yeah, it just needs to be approximately the the same because I'm gonna. You know, I'm going to be moving stuff around anyway, and and that shot's actually zooming and panning and tilting and everything anyway. So I'm, I, you know, I had to track all that anyway. So it didn't, you know, it, um, yeah, it, it didn't, it didn't really matter. It just needed to be about the same. Now that that is just fascinating, and people should really be following your Twitter, um, Steve Yedlin on Twitter. You and you need a visual reference when he's talking about this stuff, guys. Like, because I was looking at it, and it it makes so much more sense when you're looking at it. So <laughs> go there, look at, uh, go find his posting on December 2nd, and you'll see exactly what we're talking about. And that actually um, was a question that we got also from Jason Baudock on Twitter. Um, he wanted to know about the VFX comping shot. So we covered that, which is great. Now we just have a couple minutes left, and I know I promised the audience a Star Wars question. We've got one <laughs> from Nick Field 90 on Twitter, and he wants to know if you can give a little insight into how you shot the Ray and Kylo verse i you're gonna have to tell me how to pronounce this guy's name because i don't know what this is the praetorian pr guards lightsaber oh, uh -huh. well, yeah. I, I i don't know what i'm talking about yeah. so i'm not even gonna <laughs> pretend that i do but uh -huh. i did see the scene i found it on yeah. youtube so i know the scene we're talking about but can you just you know briefly because we don't have a lot of time just kind of mm -hmm. talk to us a little bit about that scene so that we can make nick field happy and all the people that are <laughs> listening saying yeah why no, can't ben just like star wars so that i can get into it <laughs> no ab absolutely so that <laughs> so the um you know the the our amazing stunt team had worked uh and and the and the, you know and all the uh, fighting choreography people and everything. They, I mean, they had absolutely completely worked this out with Ryan and the actors. Um, they had done so much work on it so that when we got there to shoot it on the, you know, on that day, it was a dance that everybody knew. And Ryan was able to do these really lyrical shots, but the, the method, so, so for the camera part, I'll, I'll just do a quick camera thing and then a, a lighting thing. So for the camera part, you know, we have these incredible and evolving shots where it's, you know, it'll be like you're pushing with somebody, but then somebody else takes over and it pans across and starts stalling the other direction and all this. But the thing is, you know, even though, you know, they had choreographed it like crazy and it was this complex fight stuff because they had it so down, Ryan could kind of extemporize with these shots and, um, you know, do them the way that he does even a dialogue scene where he holds the finder and he's just like, okay, we're going to go from here. And then when this happens, we go to there because the stunt team could, could show him step by step everything. And they knew it so well. Um, so, you know, we, we had these really elaborate shots that, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very, um, 
you know, I think in some ways classic, uh, you know, all these choreographed evolving shots, it's not that contemporary thing where when there's a fight, there's a lot of fast cutting and, and tight, shaky shots that cut really fast. I mean, it really yeah. is um, evolving and choreographed and that's kind of how that was possible. And then, and, you know, most of the shots were just done on a, on a dolly with a, with a stabilized head so that we were just rolling on the floor with no track or anything, but we had the stabilized head. So it wasn't bumping. Um, and, uh, you know, and for the, um, and, you know, for the, so that, that was kind of on the camera side and, you know, on the lighting side, um, you know, Ryan really wanted that super deep, uh, red that you see on the background. Um, but we also, yeah. And, but we also decided we didn't really want that to be light that was spilling and hitting people. We wanted it more to be, it's that crazy background that's red. So we, you know, we were really specific working with, um, the, um, uh, with the production designer and everybody in the art department about what that red was, making sure that Ryan liked it. And then we weren't, even though it was a very red cloth, uh, we were also lighting it with red light to make it even more vibrantly red, which we also kind of calibrated really specifically to be, um, you know, cause Ryan and I both don't like it when the red gets too magenta. It looks, uh, I don't know. It just looks like electronic and weird. So, yeah. you know, we had this, we had this really specific red light on the really specific red, <laughs> um, stuff. And, but, but, uh, you know, that really was just in the background. And then, you know, the, the, the foreground was, was lit more, uh, with a, you know, mostly with a diffused top light kind of over the whole set where we would change which parts of it were brighter or darker to, to make the, the, to make the shape. So it's not just a, you know, not just a blob coming from the whole ceiling. Um, yeah, so we would, so we would kind of, you know, we were able to create the, the, the texture and shape that way. And then also in that space in general, although less in the, in that fight scene, you know, we also had, you know, we would also bring in just one or two small lights on a stand to really finish sculpting a, a you know, a close up or, or something like that. But, um, you know, for this, for the fight scene, it was mostly, you know, like I said, about changing the, um, uh, the relative brightness of different parts of this sort of, uh, this diffusion that was really coming from all around. Well, Steve, I thank you so much for coming to the show, talking about your work. Your stuff is so great. I mean, what a portfolio of films. Like, I I'm, I'm such a fan of your work, and I think everybody should be checking out your website to see what you've been working on, certainly, but also look at these resources here. I mean, you clearly like the technical aspect of filmmaking, and uh, you love talking about it. You do do a great job talking about it. I think a lot of our audience can learn uh, quite a bit from your website, yedlin.net on Twitter, Steve Yedlin. Um, of course, the film is Knives Out and all your other great work. And thank you so much for being on. Uh, thanks so much for having me. What a pleasure. All right. I want to thank Steve Yedlin for coming on the show and educating us. He really did. There was a lot to learn in that episode, and I would love to hear your feedback. So please find us on social media. Let us know what you think of this episode. I also want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gainstructure.com, gainstructure.com. And our producer, Connor Crosby, you can find him at ignitionvisuals.com, ignitionvisuals.com. But of course, You've got to be checking out GoCreativeShow.com. Sign our mailing list so you know exactly what's going on with the show. There's a lot of news coming up in 2020, and you want to be the first to know. Uh, follow us on all of our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. All of those things, of course, at Go Creative Show. And our sponsors, Rule Boston Camera and Post Lab. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. So please support those that support us, and we will see you next week. Hey.